Hi, I'm Holly, and with my sister Heather, you're listening to Haunted Family Podcast, a weekly podcast about the paranormal, unsolved mysteries, and even some true crime. You know, it seems to me, looking through our um, Podbean analytics, that our true crime seems to be doing a lot better than our paranormal lately. Mm Mm-hmm. So, listen, paranormal people, you need to get on the ball. I think it's well, because true. What, what was she true saying? True crime is more interesting. I don't think it's more interesting. I think that we know crime happens. It's a fact. We can, you know, understand it a little bit better than the paranormal. Maybe. And I will say that since today's episode is a paranormal topic, and I just want to tell our dear listeners that if you know anybody. If you hear anybody who claims to be a paranormal expert, laugh at them. There's no such thing. Well, we're not paranormal experts, but we have a podcast. I know we have a podcast. And we've had paranormal experiences pretty much since the day we were born. But we're not experts. No one can be an expert. We don't have the science, the technology, or even the mental capabilities at this point in time to fully grasp what the paranormal is to the point where we can say that we are experts in it. And that goes for everybody. You're not an expert in it. I'm sorry if I've just offended somebody out there. You'll get over it. Probably not. So, today we are talking about Poltergeists. I know. See, I hate doing topics like this. They're so scary. Well, I will say that I was deeply, deeply disturbed by the third Poltergeist movie where they're in the high rise and, you know, they got ghosts coming out of mirrors and stuff. Well, you have a thing against mirrors. I do. But that movie just, that movie terrified me. Well, okay, I know that this is not our topic, I mean, poltergeists are our topic, but the movie Poltergeist is not our topic, but man, that movie had some bad luck. It did. Like, everybody in the movie died in real life. Well, I mean, everyone's going to die eventually. Okay, true, but, I mean, when you look at... 12-year-old Heather died of a bacterial infection or something. I think, she, I think it was a bacterial infection. Um, it was released in June of 82, November of that year. Uh, the person who played Dana was murdered in her own driveway. Yeah, definitely some bad luck involving the cast and crew of this movie. Well, this series of movies. Cardiac arrest. That's what Heather died of. She had uh, cardiac arrest and septic shock because she had an intestinal issue. A- acute bowel blockage. You know, some people die young. Emmy lost one of her best friends in grade school. That's true. Um, end of second grade. I don't know. I just think it's weird that so many people who had a hand in that movie had a really bad, a bad string outcome. of luck. Yeah. Um, so let's get into, I guess let's define poltergeist. Technically define poltergeist. A poltergeist is um, a German word, and it literally means noisy spirit. Those Germans are really, like, to the point. They are. And they probably say it in a way that sounds terrifying. Probably. Um... And these were, these are the ghosts that are responsible for physical and um, noise disturbances, like loud noises, being touched, being bit, hit, tripped. Um, some famous ones that our listeners may have heard of is uh, like the Bell Witch of Tennessee, which we talked about. Yeah, we talked about that. A few months ago. The Enfield Poltergeist. I think several um, podcasts have done episodes on the Enfield Poltergeist. Right. We're going to talk about that tonight, too. I don't know. I don't think that... Oh, um, Borley Rectory is also a famous one. All of the haunting shows 
go on go to Borley Rectory. I don't think that this deserves its own like genre of the paranormal. I don't think it deserves its own category of paranormal. Because I think that every ghost, every spirit is capable of physically touching you, physically moving things, or causing noises. True. Um, it kind of really annoys me when um, you when I hear people on TV, paranormal experts, or um, every year I take part in a ghost walk at the Middle Creek Battlefield, and you hear at least one, if not more, of the paranormal investigators say, use my energy in a non-harmful way if you need more strength to communicate with me. That is bull crap. They are not physical beings. They exist on a plane completely different than what we little mere mortals do. I'm sure that they can tap into the whole freaking energy of the universe if they need to. Right, which is probably way more powerful than what one person has yeah. in it. I don't believe that. I don't believe in the whole... Um, if our listeners just heard that, I did not open a beer. I opened a Mountain Dew. I forgot to bring water mm. in with me. She's <laughs> lying. Um, speaking of that, have you heard... Um, I, don't know, I know you've heard the Garth song, American Honkton Bar Association. Yes, I saw him in concert with well, you. Well, have you heard the... The recording of it, like the album release. <clears throat> mm, I don't well, think so. in the part where you hear all those people singing together, Garth actually got mm-hmm. all of his friends together in a studio to record that. And at one point in time, you hear a can opening. And he says that was actually a beer that one of his friends smuggled in, walked right up to the mic, and opened up. <laughs> I've been enjoying the um, Garth channel on um, Sirius Radio. Okay. Back to Poltergeist. Back to ghosts in general. So yeah. Ghosts don't need our energy. Ghosts don't need to drain your flashlight, your batteries. How do they do it just to mess with us? Is that your professional That is opinion? my professional opinion on this. Because I think that it would be absolutely freaking insane for them to be a, literally a being made of energy existing in the energy plane of this world and have to tap us for strength to communicate. It just It's crazy to think otherwise. For me, I'm sure that you can listen to those pair of celebrities and get a completely different take on it. Most of them are full of crap. They're just making stuff up. Seriously. Because they want to sell yes. whatever. We should start making stuff up so that we can sell stuff and be famous. Well, there it is. I just, well, I didn't make it up. It's my professional opinion after multiple years of intense study and living in haunted houses. They don't need our energy. They are powerful enough without it. It's kind of like those people who also want to say that ghosts can't hurt you. Yeah, they sure can. And I almost want to believe that people want to push these out there because it's kind of, it's soothing to their own mind to believe that ghosts are not powerful beings and that they can't hurt us. You know what I mean? Right. Okay. I think I went off on a big old tangent there. Well, I mean, I, I think it's wishful thinking or it's how they, how they're capable of, um, going on with their life. I don't know. I don't know what Comforting I'm trying to say. themselves. Yeah. See, it's kind of like um, okay, I wasn't going to talk about this because I wanted to eventually do a whole episode on it. We still can. But, like, but last year when we went to Waverly Hills. Okay. And the story that our tour guide told us about the night that they had ended all the tours and the building was empty or so they thought and they were standing down by the burn pile uh well burn i don't know what Uh, i think it it was like a barrel burn barrel burn barrel yeah and so they were all standing down there you know just kind of like talking before they 
went home for the night and they started hearing screaming and uh, they went back into the building. Oh, yes. The boys that was trapped in the um, stairwell. Right. Okay, so uh, we'll eventually do a whole episode on Waverly Hills, but it is supposedly one of the most haunted locations in Kentucky. It's it's definitely and haunted. And it's definitely very haunted. It is. I, and it... It's been on um, lots of paranormal shows, which... Doesn't always mean that I mean, a place is super haunted. Right. I, I honestly think that those shows are BS, um, but that's just me. Um, anyway, so we went to this place. It had been a literally a dream of ours for years to go tickets are kind of hard to come by to get yeah they they sell out fast and we were able to get one of the absolute last of tours the of the season we went for my and my mom's uh, birthday which um are there literally hers is one day mine is the next day and holly was very generous into um getting us tickets to go i have the yeah that i was have my the birthday best present sister in the world yeah, you do. Yeah. One year she also sprung for Metallica tickets for her birthday. She really does rock. So anybody who does not have her as a sister, which is everybody but me, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got the most awesome sister. Um, so, anyway, the story that they told us is they had left the building. They had done tours all, day, or all evening long. They start uh, right before it starts getting dark. And, well, actually, they have daylight tours also. Um, so, I, I don't know what the time was, but it was, they had concluded for the night. Well, a group of boys um, had broken into the building. It's a big building. And they had an axe. It's a, it's a gigantic building. It used to be a TV hospital. And it's very, very large. Um, they had an axe. And were able to um, break like the the. It's all open air uh, walkways, and then when you get inside, you know, like the rooms have doors. That way, they could have opened up patients' rooms, and they could have gotten fresh air, that kind of thing. So, the hallway. The hallways are open to the outside with these windows that are uh, not really windows. They're just big openings. So they had the lower floors boarded up so the people would not just come and, and walk into the hospital. And But that's what happened. These guys had an axe and they broke their way in. And they were roaming the hospital. And I cannot remember what floor they were on, Heather. Do you remember... I want to say third, but the way we were up and down, and I, I can't, I don't remember. I think it was third. Okay, so. I'm, I'm not 100% not, sure. We'll, we'll probably tell this story again when we actually do the Waverly Hills episode, and I'll know And who knows, we might go back to Waverly Hills someday and get the story again. Hopefully. Uh, while they were there, though, um, there were shadow figures that were... Um, descending upon them and the guys were trying to get out but they could not open the door to the uh, to go up the stairwell to go to a different floor to get out of the building and it was like the it was like the door was um, locked but the doors don't lock the the doors to the stairway literally just like they're super super easy to open and close but they're heavy yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're they metal were, doors. It, They've got some weight behind them. So the guys um, but they, were yeah, banging. Yeah, the, but they don't. There's no, like, catch in the doors. I mean, they're heavy, but they're well, they're well hung, and they swing easy. So it's yeah. not a case of the door just jammed. Yeah, it, no, that wasn't the case. But the guys took the axe that they had and was beating the fuck out of this door. And um, 
they were screaming and carrying on and um what happened is the people outside heard and they ran into the building and um the guys were so thankful that somebody came and rescued them and was telling them all about these shadow figures um you know it, it was just it was just kind of crazy um the people who do the tours showed them that the door just swings like there it's not you know there was no it wasn't locked it wasn't sealed or anything like that and the boys were freaked out but so. when if you go on a tour you can see they will show you the door and they will show you the axe marks in the door yeah, I'm pretty sure that I still have all of those pictures, so um, I'll try to put it on our Instagram. I'll try to remember. And if I don't, if it's like Thursday and you're listening to this episode and I have not posted anything like that, um, shoot us an email or tag us in something or just let me know because I, I forget. She's had a very busy life. <laughs> And no memory. I'm not exaggerating. She does have you a know, And if I'm not busy enough, I literally just applied for grad school. So, um, yeah, I don't know what the crap I'm thinking. Ah, good times. But she um, applied for grad school in communications. So, hopefully, our podcast improves. Hopefully. Oh, guess what? I just got a um, email from Stitcher. Saying that they just realized that we asked them a question about all the problems we was having getting ourselves loaded to Stitcher. And they realized that they never responded to us. And they're apologizing for poor customer service. Oh, well, that's nice. It is. <laughs> I wonder, wonder if they ever fixed us. Um, she says that it should be fixed now and we should just try it again. Oh, okay. So, hopefully. Well, hopefully we are on Stitcher. Oh. You talking about podcasts remind uh, about emailing us remind me that I didn't check our email today. <laughs> I do check our email, so messages. I like hearing from people. And if you do email us, you'll be talking to me. Yeah, because I don't, I don't do the email, and I don't do our YouTube. And you don't. Yeah. The, um. And you sometimes and I do you Facebook. don't really um come up with any of our paranormal topics. <laughs> no, I do not. But if you would like, I come up with about 90% of our stupid criminal. I, um, unless somebody I, was saying, I came something. up with our stupid criminal for this week. Didn't I? I thought I came up with I thought I sent you something. I thought I sent you this week's. Hold on, let me scroll up and see. No, I sent it to you. Oh. Wait, which one are we doing? I'll send it to you again. Because I thought we were doing the football We players. are. I sent it to you. Oh, I thought I sent it to you. Crazy. Okay. Never mind. Anyway, so which one do you want to start with, Heather? Let's talk about your, probably your favorite poltergeist story. And we've actually done an episode on this before. Are you talking about... I, I wondered if any of our listeners are screaming at their radio, phone, whatever the answer right now. Probably not. Yeah, we are talking about the Bell Witch of Tennessee. It's probably it's probably Which in all Holly's favorite paranormal um, story. Because she firmly believes that she has debunked this. I do. I totally, totally think that it was that damn teacher who did not want that girl to date anybody. He was kind of obsessed with her. Well, okay. Not kind of. He was. he was straight up obsessed. So do you want to give people a little rundown of what the Bell Witch was? Um, oh, I can't remember everybody's names because it's been a while. But, okay. So in Tennessee, one of my favorite states in the entire world, um, there was a family who lived on a farm and nothing happened for a while and then suddenly stuff started happening uh, but mostly it was all aimed at the dad 
and the oldest daughter. And the oldest daughter was pretty much told to uh, leave her boyfriend and to Betsy. not be with him. Betsy, Betsy yes. yes. And um, they heard chains and stuff would move. And then in the end, the dad was poisoned to death. And afterwards, nothing else happened. Well, no, the witch said it was leaving for so many years, like eight years, and then it would be back. And what happened was the daughter ended up marrying the teacher and her life sucked. But the ghost, the spirit never came back. Right. Well, you know why? Because she married the teacher. And you know what? Her life sucked. She ended up living penniless with her children. Like, like sleeping on their couch. So. Go back and find our Bell Witch episode. We explain in depth why we don't think that this was actually a haunting at all. Um, the facts really don't add up to be, it being a haunting. It was a little too stereotypical what you think a haunting would be. Yeah. Which is the case with a lot of these um, poltergeist stories. And I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. I'm just saying that you know, I think let's, let's talk a little bit about a personal family. I guess you could say poltergeist. One of the first paranormal stories my grandmother ever told me happened in Ohio. A house on Young Street in Middletown. I can give you the house number but people actually still live there so I don't want to be uh, you know shouting at their house. When the family when our family moved in they found um, that the previous owners had left some stuff behind. Um, a hall tree um, and some boxes of um, photographs in the attic. From the time they moved in until they left, they had crazy wild paranormal experiences. People being hit, shoved, pushed, our grandmother being drugged around the house by her hair, books being thrown, what you would consider to be poltergeist activity. How do we know this is true? Well, probably because Grandma never lied at all, ever. She told you the absolute straight truth, no matter how weird it sounded. But you didn't get any of these, oh, we're going to stop for a bit and then come back in six years and haunt you again. Crap. No. Ghosts don't work like that. Witches sure don't work like that. Yeah. It pretty much happens until you do yeah. something. When they were packing to move out, a box of books rose up off a table, flipped over, and spilled all the books out into the floor. Because that's how ghosts work. So, no. I, I don't believe the Bell, Bell Witch story. I think I would love to believe it. That believe it was true. Because then that means that this wasn't a, just a giant ruse put on by a very jealous, petty person. But... This was a giant bruise put on by a jealous, petty person. I mean, I kind of, I think that that's the case in some of the stories that I'm going to talk about. Which dog is yipping? I have no idea. It's in another room. Uh, one uh, paranormal story that I found fairly interesting, and I actually, I listened to a podcast about this a month or two ago. And I can't remember which podcast what. I really should make notes of these things. Probably. What's the topic? Oh, actually, hold on. I think I found it. I'm thinking that it was Lore that did the podcast that did the podcast on this one. I, I'm scrolling through, and I'm thinking that it was the Devil's Beat. Not 100 percent sure, but I'm thinking that it was the Devil's Beat episode that he did. Um, April 17th. It's the drummer of Tedworth. Okay. So you know it's going to be good because it involves a drummer. Mm, or it's going to be bad because it involves a drummer. Okay. 
So it was um, the late 1660s. Well, about the 1660s. People coming back from the war was allowed to keep their drums and use it to sort of panhandle. Like, you know how we have buskers here in cities where, you know, you drop a few dollars into their hat or into their um, guitar case. That's how they make money. Mm -hmm. um, but you had to be licensed. You had to be able to show your paperwork of what you know you were part of and all this. Well, there was an unlicensed vagrant named William Drury. Did he live on Drury Lane? Yes. Okay. That's how you say it. D-R-U-R-Y. I don't know why I have such trouble with that word. I don't know. Did he sell muffins? No. He you? just played his drum. <laughs> a local landowner, John um, Mompresson, found out that he was unlicensed and had him arrested and brought up on, you know, charges of collecting money under false pretenses, blah, blah, blah. And Mompresser won the judgment against the drummer. But, as part of the settlement, Mompresson got the drum that this guy was using. Okay. And pretty much from that point on, Mom Presser and his and his whole house was plagued by paranormal events. Strange sounds under their kids' beds, strange drumming. So it turns out that the drummer that he had had arrested was had been sent to the colonies, the United States. For those of you who don't understand what the colonies were. Which shouldn't be anybody. So it could, of course, it couldn't have been him. So of course they thought witchcraft that he was somehow tormenting Montpresson with ghostly drumming and ghostly scrapes under the bed from overseas. But I don't say but a lot. A lot of people, even in his time period, didn't believe in him, and they thought that him and his, with the help of his children, was making this whole thing up. In order to kind of get more sympathy and attention drawn to them. He wouldn't let anybody inspect his cellar. So there's a good chance that while he had people in to listen to the sounds. He had somebody in his cellar making the sounds. Yeah. That's possible. Yeah. So I mean. While the drummer of Tedworth makes for a good story. Better one not told by me. It's probably right up there with another hoax. Although. I know some drummers who would probably come back to haunt people about ghostly drumming. Yeah, possibly. Okay. I have one that made me laugh out loud. And it's always good when a ghost story can make you laugh. Yes. Okay, so this one happened in the summer of 2006. It happened in South Shields, and I have no clue where South Shields is. But this is called the South Shields Poltergeist. Oh, I found it. Okay. And it looks very pretty. It is a coastal town at the mouth of the River Tyne in England. Okay, well, so this one, um, we don't have the real names for the people, so we call them Mark and Marianne, and they had a three-year-old son. Is that a name that you made so, up for them, or is that a name that... No, the, the, the website that I found that was talking about it, that's what they called them. Um, so this poltergeist did what normal poltergeists do, and they move shit, and they slam doors, and, you know, the whole, um, Scooby-Doo, you know, chain, dragging on floor, slamming doors, that kind of, you know, thing. I don't know why I always think of Scooby-Doo when I think of poltergeists, but anyway. So, that's what, that's what this poltergeist did. Except... It also did one other thing. What did it do? It threw small, cuddly, stuffed animals at them. That's not like the best ghost ever. I know. I would be like, hey, can we throw it into the toy bin? Actually, probably not the best ghost ever. Did I ever tell you about what happened to me probably three years ago? I was sitting no. in the living room. And from the living room, I can just see into the door of my bedroom. I'm sitting there with my dog, and it's just me and the dog home. And we hear a small thud on the bed. And we look in, and his toys are falling from the ceiling area. 
Oh. I had just cleaned the living room and packed up all of his toys and put them in a basket in um, the bedroom. So, that was really weird. I guess I have a poltergeist. It needs to start... Who likes to throw... It needs to start earning its keep by taking up my trash. Well, I wouldn't know if I had a poltergeist because if I hear noises and stuff falling or... Uh, actually, I was just telling Heather before we started recording that I have a uh, hutch in my kitchen. And it's gigantic. It's probably over six feet tall. I bought it for you when wide. Emmy was a baby. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's big. It's heavy. Uh, and it had probably three shelves in it. And all of the shelves broke right down the middle and I haven't got new shelves because I I would have to like make them and so I'm trying to decide what I want to do with the hutch so right now it's just sitting in my kitchen and there's crap everywhere because you know the stuff that was on the shelves are no longer on the shelves so I don't know that if I would have a poltergeist because the cats knock stuff over all the time so who knows you probably actually do have a poltergeist well, I, my next door neighbor died um, last year about this time. And ever since she died, stuff has happened over here. But I think she's just lonely. She Actually, nice you know, what, what was really weird about that is that one of your kids messaged me about seeing something weird in the house before you all even found out that she had died. Yeah. She, she was there a couple days before anybody noticed. Super sweet lady, though. I miss her to pieces. So, there's this little farm called the Ringcroft of Stocking. I'm assuming this is in England. Oh, wait. Sorry. It's in Scotland. And it is near Rurik, Scotland. And this one is kind of an interesting one. Um, it was a little, it was a house owned by a stonemason and part-time farmer, Andrew Mackey. And the spirit of this house liked to throw rocks at people. And it would move his cattle from one field to another and set fire to buildings randomly. But this is what I found was interesting because it kind of is, goes with um, what Grandma experienced. This ghost would grab people by the hair and drag them around and hit them. But it would also leave them notes written in blood. I can't find any article that, you know, absolutely verifies that it was blood. And if it was human blood, animal blood, their blood. Um, but this was all recorded by a local minister named Alexander Telfair in 1696. He said that the neighbors um, even experienced being hit by rocks and beaten anytime they got close to the farm. Well, so they have their own little security system. According to the minister, Andrew McKee supposedly took an oath to the devil and gave his oldest child to the devil. Why would you do that? I don't know. Oh wait, I read that wrong. He had taken an oath that he promised to give the devil his first child, but then he didn't. And he also failed to burn a tooth buried under the threshold of the stone. I don't really understand what they're getting with that. But many years later, and by many years later, I mean 1890s, the Saturday Review did an article on this, and they dismissed it as, and I'm quoting here, a curious mixture of obvious naked imposture, saying five ministers, a few lards, and a number of farmers signed this account in which not a single suspicious breath that the business was merely a practical joke. Mr. Telfair recites it as an argument against atheism and for further and other reasons for edification. And that the voices people were hearing was actually his children who had mastered um, ventriloquism. Ventrilo Ventriloquism. Yes. Well, when you're listening to this podcast and you hear screaming and 
disembodied voices in the background, that's my children. And they haven't practiced ventriloquism. They're just loud. They are. If you hear loud screaming behind me, it's probably my redneck neighbors. And they're fighting over race cars and wedge. And I, w I heard them the other day f um, arguing about... It needs to be 35 cold. If anybody knows what 35 cold means, let me know. <laughs> but it really puzzled me. I didn't want to ask them because I don't really like them that much. <sighs> yeah, besides the Bell Witch, really most of the ones that I have found have been in England. You English people love your poltergeists, apparently. Well, I think it's because their country is older than ours. Probably. Well, I mean, the land here is older. I don't really think that Native Americans had a special name for poltergeist. We have, you know, other things, like the puck wedgie. That's, <laughs> I will say, the one thing that I fell in love with about New England is the stories of puck wedgie. That is just so awesome. I want a pet puck that, wedgie. That will be an episode. <laughs> yes. Okay. So... Um, the next poltergeist story that I have is the Enfield poltergeist. And this is actually the basis of the movie Conjuring 2, which I'm going to just stop right here and admit that I haven't watched it. I, uh, I don't think I've watched it either. Maybe I have. Is it on Netflix yet? I don't know. Um, I have no idea. I think that there's been several YouTube, several YouTube channels. There's been several, um, Podcast done about the Borley Rectory, too. Not Enfield. Sorry, I was looking at my notes because we're going to be talking about Borley Rectory later in this episode. Spoiler alert. Okay, so this happened in Enfield, England, in between 1977 and 79. I think this is kind of... Okay, I'm not going to say it's like the Bell Witch because there was no, you know, teacher involved or anything, but I don't know. I just don't really get it. So Peggy Hodgson was a single mom and she called the police because her two, two, she had four kids, two of them were claiming that the furniture was moving and they were hearing knocking sounds on the walls um, and these kids were her 14 year old daughter Margaret and her 11 year old daughter Janet. Um, there was also 10 year old Johnny and 7 year old Billy but they didn't really say that they saw anything. Um, the police constable said that he saw a chair sliding across the floor, but he was convinced that nobody touched it. Um, they claimed that they heard dis uh, demonic voices, loud noises, thrown rocks, and toys. I wonder if they were like stuffed teddy bears and stuff like the other house. Uh, chairs overturning and children levitating. That'd be fun. They had experts... I know, I know you love that term, but they had paranormal investigators come in and blamed it on, you know, like, it's, it's poltergeist, right? Um, I don't know. I think it's faked. I think the girls were wanting attention. There's a famous picture of one of the children supposedly being yanked in the air by a ghost, right? But to me, it just looks like a kid jumping on a bed. And it just looked like some of the instances were staged, like nothing ever happened in front of people. Um, during an interview, they asked the girls, how does it feel to be in a haunted house with a poltergeist? And Janet replied, it's not haunted. But then Margaret interrupted and told her to shut up. If, so, if somebody asked one of your children... What it was like to be in the house that's haunted? They tell. They tell you. Yeah, like yeah. no hesitation. Well, then they'd probably look at me and Holly to ask if it was okay to talk about it because, despite the fact that we have a paranormal and true crime podcast, we spent most of our life not wanting to talk about things we experienced. Yeah. So this, I don't know. In this one, I think it's all like the the timing, you know. Everything happened when eyes weren't on the situation. Um, I just... I think the girls, for whatever reason, wanted attention. Because I can't imagine that you would be living in a house where you're, ter you're, you're being terrorized. And, you know, your two of your siblings have no clue what's going on. 
And this is supposed to go on for two years. Yeah, and this happened in, I mean, like, 77 to 79. We think they had better footage of it. Yeah. Well, better proof. cameras and stuff. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I think it's crap, but that's just me. Okay, so I don't know if most people would technically consider this a poltergeist, but it sort of is. I watched it for the first time on one of those paranormal shows on TV. Um, but this one actually has law enforcement validating. You don't get that with a lot of story of Don Decker. Also known as the Rain Man. Not the same as the Rain Man from the movie. I was gonna ask you that. No, this that was a good movie. This story Yeah, sucks. this story started in late February of um nineteen eighty three, so I was like a baby. Um I was not. Don Decker's grandfather, James Kisho, died. Um, okay. Yeah. James had abused Don when Don was a child. Don didn't go to his funeral. He was actually in jail at the time. Um, oh, wait, no. Sorry. He went to the funeral. He But he was in jail at the time. He was given a furlough so that he could attend the funeral and spend a couple of days with his family. Closure. Um, in a lot of states, like in Kentucky, um, you actually, you have to go to the, um, you have to go see the body, it's private, you're not allowed to have any contact with any family members, and then you go back to prison, and I think you have to pay to do that. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. Um, but while he was, while he was there, he was invited to, um, spend the night with some friends of the family. And at some point in the night, some point in that evening, something happened. Don fell into a trance state. I can't say that I've ever really been in a trance lot state. Unless it's, you know, I'm so out of it from a migraine that I can't function in any more trance. Right. And while he was in this trance, the keepers noticed water sliding down their living room walls and dripping from the ceiling. They did what any logical human being would do. They called their landlord. Well, and, yeah. Yeah, the landlord Sometimes was... I miss having a landlord because my bathtub has been stopped up forever. Do you need me to come fix it? Please. I, I've had somebody come and look at it. I've poured so much chemicals down it. This is what you get when you have four girls with super long hair. And one bathroom. And one bathroom and... Um, Four long-haired dogs. We might have to climb under the house and get that pipe and have that pipe loose and clean it. Well, I had somebody who was supposed to do that, and they said they couldn't get it off. So, maybe, Anthony? Maybe. He could fit under your house. Yeah. Uh, he might be able to... I don't know if he can fit through the hole, but... We'll see. Um, so, the landlord walked in, and he was puzzled because there was no water lines running above the ceiling in the living room. None. And it wasn't raining outside, so it couldn't be a leak. So, I, I don't know at what point they decided to make the jump from, okay, there's no pipes here, it's not raining outside, let's call the cops. That wouldn't enter my mind at this point, but they did. And Officer Richard Wolbert showed up, Strasburg Police Department. And he said it was raining so hard inside this house that he was drenched within moments of entering their door. Um, from his uh, personal account, he said, We were standing just inside the front door and met this droplet of water traveling horizontally. And it passed between us and traveled out to the, other ne to the next room. Oh. He was joined a few minutes later by a, another officer, Officer John... Bojan. Bojan. I don't know. I'm saying that name wrong. I'm so sorry, Mr. He probably will never listen to this episode, but I'm just really bad at names. And um, this officer stated that he literally had a chill going up his spine. Made the hair stand up on your neck. That's how I felt. This was a situation where things were happening that I never, ever dreamed were possible to happen. There was no way to explain what was going on. 
I know a lot of cops. It takes a lot to shake them. So the fact that these two officers literally had chills running up their spine because it was raining inside this house lets you know that something weird was really happening. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, Dawn was still in a trance-like state at this time. So the officers escorted him out of the house. They took him um, just down the block to a pizzeria. As soon as they left, the house returned to normal. It stopped raining in the house. Hmm. I mean, of course, you know, the family who lived there immediately noticed. Um, but, you know, the family, they still liked Don, and they knew Don still needed a place to stay. So they invited him back. Because they're apparently crazy. Yeah. Um, at this point in time, the landlord was there, his wife was there, the keepers were there, and the police officers were there. As soon as Don entered the home, pots and pans started rattling in the kitchen. Um, the landlord and his wife immediately think that Don is somehow playing a very destructive prank on them. Because, you know, water damage is serious business. Right. Um, Don finds himself elevated off the ground like he had been picked up and thrown against the wall. And the chief of police decides that he's going to show up because, you know, that's what they do. There's something strange going on. Two of their officers are tied up at a weird house. It's raining. He's going to show up and see what in the world's going on. He walks in, looks around, declares that it is a plumbing issue and that there is no need to investigate any further. The officers, <laughs> yeah, the, the officers didn't listen to him. They stayed, um, and even the next day, they came back with two other officers to investigate it further. I, I guess I'm... Okay. I don't know where there is a crime. There's why, not a crime. Why are there officers investigating? There's not a crime. Well, I mean, I have it on good authority that at one point in time, several members of the Johnson County um, law enforcement community and several... EMTs, paramedics, and firefighters broke into a haunted house in Paintsville that was empty at the time because they were curious. Um, are we friends with one of these um, EMT paramedics? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think he was involved in it. Okay, I, don't, I didn't want to say his name just in case. You know, because that is a crime. Yes. And he has a new baby. And, um, we don't want to jeopardize. And his baby is adorable. Anything. I know. Oh my God. So cute. If he's listening, we think your baby's adorable. And I'm sure you know who you are. No. I don't think he was involved. Um, on another time that the, um, the law enforcement was there, they uh, put a cross in his hand. And Don said that the cross was burning him. The officer took the cross back from him and said, It's not hot, hot. But it is hot. And shortly thereafter, Don once again was picked up and thrown against a wall. One of the officers, Officer, no, oh, sorry, Lieutenant John Rundle, was quoted as saying, All of a sudden he lifted off the ground and flew across the room with the force as though a bus had hit him. And there was three claw marks on the side of his neck, which drew blood. I have no answer for it whatsoever. I just draw a blank, even today. Um, and this story, we could actually do a whole episode just on the Rain Man. Because it goes on. Um, I, it, originally the story came from Unsolved Mysteries, but other paranormal shows have picked it up before. Um, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think he might still be, I think he might be back in prison for setting fire to a restaurant in 2012. Um, but... I think ultimately this might be one of the few paranormal culture guy styles cases that I believe might be true. Just because how could you have such an elaborate hoax to have it raining inside someone's home and you just showed up to their house after having been in jail? Yeah, like how'd you set that up? Yeah, I I can't wrap my mind around how how you could hoax something like that without having the renters involved in it and what renter is going to throw away their security deposit to let you put on such an elaborate hoax although I've never gotten a security deposit back 
I have never had to leave a security closet. I have, and I've never gotten one back. Not that I've ever done anything. It's just, I always keep it. Okay, so my next story is super famous. Everybody knows it, I believe. Blair Witch? Um, no. Amityville. No, that's not a poltergeist case, and that's fake. Sorry. Um, Amityville is okay. actually not on my list of paranormal. I don't know why poltergeist. It's not. Well, actually, this is another one of those cases where I don't think that it's real. Um, the hauntings that supposedly happen in this house kind of stemmed from one night. One night of madness. Um, so Can you've I just got... say that I'm kind of sad that like, while we were on our East Coast tour of pilot truck stops that we did not stop here? Well, when we were driving and, I mean, I don't know if you remember, but I drove through upstate New York and everybody was asleep except for me. And I didn't know where I was going. So, sorry. Next time next time yes because there will be a next time that's a threat okay, and a so, promise eastern seaboard yeah new england we're coming for you again bigger and better than ever <laughs> um okay so right before thanksgiving you've got butch De defeo Theo defeo okay um he is the sole survivor of a night that ended in his mother, two brothers, and two sisters. Um, why did it say right before Thanksgiving? Oh, the, the trial. Sorry. Scratch all of that. The murder actually happened December 4th, 1975. So, so just before Christmas. Just before Christmas. And it wasn't until Thanksgiving of the next year. And this is an actual true case. Right. So this is this is our true crime for the night. Um, okay. So. He is serving six concurrent 25 to life sentences. Yeah. He's never getting out. Um, okay. So Butch said now, that his father. Right. My um, um, the thing I've got says November 13th is when the killings happened. Okay, we actually have no clue when the killings happened. <laughs> well, we didn't know where it happened. 112 Ocean Avenue, Amityville, Long Island, New York. We know that. Yeah. Okay, we'll say that it happened November 12th, because that just makes sense. So, um, Butch said that his father was abusive and just kind of a domineering man. Well, I mean, we think. We really only have his take on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he said that his 18-year-old sister, Dawn, was mad at him because she wanted to um, see her boyfriend in Florida. And the dad said no. So, that night, Butch, his 18-year-old sister, Dawn, and two of Butch's friends were in their basement getting high. And Dawn... Went to her brother and said, "Listen, we just we should kill our parents." Because that's a and, logical conversation to be having with somebody. Yes, and okay, so Butch was like, mm, "No, well, let's not." But then, after they did drugs and alcohol for hours, he was like, "Well, sure, all right, why not? Let's kill them." So, asking he has his two friends that were there to help, and. So Butch and Don left the parent or left the basement, went to their parents' room, and um, actually, you're right. It happened about 1 a.m. November 13th. So um, they shot their parents, then uh, moved on. Um, the dad struggled and was able to like fight them off a little bit, but they shot him a second time and he died. Uh, Louise. The mother was in bed and she was moaning for them to help and she was just slowly bleeding to death until they finally shot her a second time um, 
they were going to leave the kids alive and just take them to the grandparents' house, but uh, when Butch ran out to get his friend who was freaking out and trying to run away, Dawn killed her siblings. How lovely of her. Yeah. Um, so she had the boys lay face down and then that's how she shot them. She shot them in the back while they were face down. So they had to have known that it was their sister that was killing them. Uh, then she went to her sister's room and um, shot her. The sister was apparently really pretty and Dawn was jealous. So she made sure to shoot her um, through her cheek and it exited out her ear. So she was she was dead and you know she was no longer beautiful. Butch comes back is pissed off because Dawn has killed everybody even though originally she just wanted to kill the parents and they fought over the gun and he knocked her out with the gun and then he just shot her. He had claimed um, later in a 440 page motion um, to get his conviction vacated that he didn't kill anybody except for Dawn. Yeah, that she killed everybody. He was kind of hosed at trial. They blamed it all on him. Of course, Dawn was dead, so you know she couldn't stand trial for her actions. And the two friends got let off. Like actually, they 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 nothing ever happened to him. They never got charged with anything. Um, and when they did um, gunpowder residue testing on Dawn, they did find that she had shot. So, it looked like what Butch was saying was true, but, but without, nonetheless, without, he took... Yeah, without Dawn being alive, we don't know to what extent she took part in the killings. Yeah, so he... He took it all. Okay, so he couldn't inherit the property. Everybody else in the family was dead, so they couldn't inherit the property. So, the house went up for sale. And the house was bought... Oh, uh, about said, a year. Yeah, it said empty for about just over a year, which yeah. I honestly do not find very odd. No, uh, I mean, like I said, the house next door to me um, has been for sale for a year. I am, I'm looking to buy a, a new house, and it's been on the market for. Well, it's been on the market off and on for a while. So, do you think you can get the price down any lower on that? We're going to try. Anyway, if, so... If Holly moves to a new house, she'll be able to set up a recording studio. And hopefully yeah. you all won't hear big trucks going past or sirens. And ambulances <laughs> and children screaming. And I'll actually have a studio. Um, anyway, I will so still be recording in my bedroom. So nothing will change there. <laughs> the um, house was empty for about a year. And the Lutzes moved in, George and Kathy Lutz, along with their three children. Now, they said that shortly after moving in, and this is a six-bedroom house. Gorgeous. They got it for $80,000. Yes. Which is I, a steal. Okay. The house that we're looking at is a five-bedroom house, and it's well over $80,000. Um... So anyway, this house is gorgeous. This house also had a room. pool and a boathouse. It was located yeah. on the canal. So prime real estate. Oh yes. Um, they said that the um, doors and hinges to the cabinets would slam. There would be noxious green slime oozing from the ceilings. A biblical scale swarm of insects attacking them, demonic faces, glowing red eyes, uh, pretty much anything terrifying that you can think of was happening in this house. A priest was called and he supposedly uh, was driven back and had blisters on his hands uh, and was told to get out. So 
this house was okay so i can't find um the property value for 112 ocean avenue but there's a house just down the street from there so five bedroom two bath on a half acre lot um it is on the market right now for five hundred and fifty thousand dollars wow so um the Lutzes said that the house was was hell and that they were uh, being attacked by, you know, demonic presence and that they believe that that's why uh, DeFeo killed his family, that he went crazy and killed them. So 28 days after they moved in, they moved out. In a hurry. In the middle of the night, apparently. Yes. I will say this right now. I have seen some pretty scary stuff. Paranormal stuff. I haven't experienced anything and I probably will never experience anything that would force me to move out of my house. True. If anything, and if there's any ghosts in this house listening to me right now, you can take this as a challenge if you want to. If you try any of that, you will just deepen my resolve and it'll be a fight. And I think the same would pretty much be said for Holly. You will just make us matter. So, what gets me is so this house was supposedly that haunted. They move out after 28 days. They immediately seek out Jay Anson to help them write the story. Which then later turned into a screenplay and, you know, then multiple sequels and so yeah they only owned this house for less than a month but they made a gigantic profit on this story and this was actually one of the they called in the Warrens Ed and Lorraine self-described demonologists and I will say that almost every story that the Warrens have been connected to don't hold up the scrutiny. They make for good movies. They make for good stories. But when you dig into the meat and bones of it, there's things that just aren't job. Yeah. So, anyway, that's, um, I think that it's, it's a case of a spoiled kid not getting his way, killing his parents, and then another, co another couple profiting off of uh, family drama. Holly, do you know what other case the Warrens were connected to? No, what? The Enfield Poltergeist. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. They said that it was classic demonic possession. The Warrens were a little too quick to jump to demon. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, um, I think Amityville makes for a good story. Made for decent movies crappy sequels um let's see according to wikipedia there are 14 amityville movies really yeah including amityville 3d the first one came out just four years after the lutzes moved out and the people i think it's what needs to be said that the people who have moved into the house after the lutzes uh, they all say that nothing, nothing has ever happened in that house. Um, George Lutz went on to register the phrase the Amityville Horror as a trademark in 2002. Um, he has an official Amityville uh, website. I think that this was a big money grab. Oh yeah, me too. And I think for listeners in our last episode dealing with the Tate murders where we talked about the woman who um, wanted to marry Charles Manson so that she could have control of his body after he died so that she could make yeah. it into an attraction for money. I think the Lutzes bought this house with the sole intent of sensationalizing and capitalizing on the DeFeo murders. I hope I don't get sued by George Lutz for saying that. Right. Well, I agree with you. A lot of your famous hauntings make for good story, but they don't hold up to scrutiny. And Amityville doesn't hold up to scrutiny. And most of the stories 
most of the cases Ed and Lorraine Warren were involved in don't really hold up to scrutiny. That's it, Holly. Maybe you should say your house is haunted, run out screaming in the middle of the night, and then capitalize on the Moorhead haunting. Yeah, that just takes too much effort. Truth. Besides, campus will always be more haunted than your house. Absolutely. Like, there's nothing that could happen here that would rival what happens over there. We need to add that to the list of things we talk about. Yes. Pervert Peak. Um, the Nun Hall Girl. All of it. Be so much fun. So, we're back in England for our next story. Because you British people and your poltergeist. Um, and we're going to talk about the Borley Rectory. Pretty famous haunting. This building was built in 1862 and it is a rectory so it's like the house for clergy and it has apparently been named the most haunted house in all of England it's a pretty bold claim I think I know I always think when it, people say the most whatever I'm like mm-hmm all right so what makes this one the most um, it's it was built just across from Borley Church, and shortly after it was built, um, the Reverend Henry Dawson Ellis Bull, the big name, moved yeah. in with his family of 14 kids. Dang, yeah. as Emmy said today, get off of her already! <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> The first paranormal occurrences happened in the house that was reported in the house just a year later in 1863 when people started hearing unexplained footsteps. You know, it might have just been another one of their kids. They they're 14. How the hell would they know? It, I imagine it would be like your house, which is just like a zoo. Only instead of cats, it's like kids. Everywhere. Crazy. But... The organist said that he saw apparition. Okay. And other locals started seeing weird things. Like a phantom coach driven by two headless horsemen. That's scary. Yeah. After um, the senior Mr. Bull died, one of his sons took over as the reverend of that church and of course moved on well, I guess stayed in the house um, over the years they've had a lot of like sensitives and psychics and things in that says that it's um, that they've made contact with at least two or three or four or five billion spirits that live in the house but no real you know psychics can just tell you what they feel they don't, can't like prove any of it but they have things thrown in this house like all the time stones and bases and you know your typical you know I'm going to throw things at you probably not cuddly toys though so lame one of, the, on. one of the weird things and you know how I love mirrors the ghost in this house likes to type messages out in Morse code on the mirrors oh but it kind of sounds like it's coming from behind the mirror like inside the mirror how could you tell the difference you know, I, I said earlier that there's nothing that something could do to make me leave. That might drive me out of this place. Maybe not for good, uh, because I come back with reinforcements. you just get rid of all your mirrors. I would. I'd throw them all out. Put them in the burn pit, surround them by salt, set it on fire. Well, is that all for the rectory? No. Um, because in 1929, a... Um, news organization, the Daily Mirror, arranged for a paranormal researcher slash conjurer to come and investigate the house. And apparently he was really good at according to some people who lived in the house and was connected to it, was great at falsifying hauntings. Like making things happen and faking it. But, you know, this really doesn't explain the fact that this house has had haunting since 1863. Right. I mean, the guy probably does fake, but... Yeah. Um, I mean, when over four decades, probably longer than that, actually, 
multiple people in the towns around this saw, you know, a coach driven by headless horsemen. You can't really, you know, fake it. And there's a, there's a lot of pictures of ghosts around the Borley record. Um, a lot of them are old pictures. I'm sure some of them are fake because you get that. And even in 1863, 1864, 1865, when photography was really in its infancy, it was possible to fake paranormal pictures. And they would. Um, in 1939, the place caught fire. The owner knocked over an oil lamp and the fire, I mean, it was just, it was gone before they, anyone could control it. Burnt the house to the ground. Um, and at this time, the same person who had been hired to, um, the paranormal researcher had hired to kind of investigate the place, came in and did some digging and in one of the cellars he found two bones that he believed belonged to one of the females who haunted the house and they were given a proper burial in a nearby churchyard um, but a lot of people who visit the site still say they see things and hear things so I mean it's, it's possible possibly I mean if it's been haunted for that long it's um, probably true. You get, uh, there's a lot of see the Society for Physical Research said that it really came down to um, that it had to have either been faked or caused by rats and strange acoustics of the odd shaped house. I don't buy that because do you know how difficult it would be to keep up a continuous strain of faking a haunting from 1862 until the 1940s. Yeah, it would be really hard. So, I mean, could some of them have been exaggerating a little bit? Maybe. Possibly. But I think at its very core, the house was haunted. Um, but, I don't know. Like I said at the beginning of this episode, I really don't like the term poltergeist. I don't really think it's needed or necessary. Because every ghost has the potential of physically touching you, physically moving an object, or making sound. Every yeah. single ghost. It, with the exception of, I don't know. Um, no, I'd say even a residual haunting has the potential of making sound. Yeah, I mean, I would say. Because you hear um, the Irish Brigade at Antietam. I believe that it is probably a residual haunting, but you can hear them chanting as they come across the field toward the sunken road. So, yeah. Every ghost, every spirit has the potential to make sound. And that is my broad, paranormal, non-expert opinion for this episode. Well... I should be a pair of celebrity. You should... Why do we not have our own show where we're crazy ghost hunters? We'd be a lot better than some. Truth. But you know, I think we'd be probably too hard to control. Because we're not about faking evidence. We're not We don't scream and run off. Yeah, we're not about to scream over the slightest little bump or cat meow in the distance. It takes a lot to get us to the point where we're like, yeah, that's paranormal. Yeah, I mean, this is a paranormal episode, and we we're not afraid to say, that's crap. Yeah, we debunked half our stories. And I think some of that is, we really want to be able to see it, experience it with our own senses, before we're 100% right. sure that it is actually happening. Right, and I mean, I, I, I mean, a lot of these can easily be faked, like the shows that, you know, we're talking about. So, Well, I have a funny, stupid criminal. I know, because I sent it to you. I really thought that I sent it to you, though. No, I can send okay. you a screenshot that shows me sending it to you. Oh, that's fine. Okay. But I... Well, I'm looking at it, and you really did send it to me, but... I, okay, I guess what I'm saying is I wish that I had sent it to you because it's, it's right up my alley. It's funny. 
Probably and not actually, the person involved in it, but it's funny. No, and when you sent it to me, even though I swear I thought I sent it to you, I sent it. I sent it to Ernie because I thought that he would get a kick out of it too. Um, seeing how he played football, I thought that he would appreciate what happens in the story. So, um, so in Albuquerque, New Mexico, you've got a man who is 21, Angelo Martinez, and he was hanging around a community center on August the 11th there were men that were playing football and when they left at the field and were going to their car martinez asked them for a ride the guy said sure and took him to the address that he had said well when they get there martinez pulls out a gun and attempts to carjack them in case you haven't caught on it's really really stupid to try to carjack some football players they work One out guy, they lift weights did not end well for Angelo Martinez. Um, they, I guess you could say they restrained him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could say that. They, you could also say they punched him in the face. <laughs> Judging um, by so, his face, probably more than once. Oh, I would say he looks. Um, he looks pretty sad. Both of his eyes are uh, swollen shut. He has um, a bruise above his eye. He has black eyes. His lips are not busted. No, well, that's a good thing. That's about the only he thing. He can enter his plea in court. <laughs> um, Which was probably, I'm stupid. The, apparently the gun that he was trying to carjack them with it was a fake gun. Yeah, and he dropped it at that. Like, he dropped it, and that's when he got punched in the face. And, and then... So, the yeah, um, the young men called the cops, the cops arrived, and they took Mr. Martinez off of their hands and booked him into jail, where they found a knife on him, but, I mean, the knife and the fake gun did not do him any service, because he got the crap kicked, the beat out of him. Moral of this story... Do not carjack a football player. Actually, don't carjack anybody. Because that little old lady you think about carjacking, she could be like, you know, a master in kung fu or whatever. Oh, and she that could, reminds me of a story today. And she could take so, you out. Or if you had a holly, she could walking. just shoot you. Well, Emmy and I were walking today, and she was talking about... Uh, celebrities and how sometimes their fans get crazy and you know like end up killing them and stuff and she said that's what I worry the most about um, if and when I become famous is that you know like well what do I do if you know if somebody tries to uh, shoot me or whatever and I said oh don't worry baby I'll take care of you I'll, I'll protect you and she said mom you are four foot Nine. I'm really four foot ten though, but she said, um, "I don't let me find the whole story, cause, the whole thing, because I wrote it down because I did not want to forget it because it was hysterical." Um, shit, I know I want to fill this out, but okay. She said, uh, "Mom, you're four foot nine. Admittedly, you're four foot nine of bald fury, but you're still four foot nine." <laughs> <laughs> That is great. I'm right. I know. I'm not four foot nine though. I'm four foot ten. That one extra inch helps. It does. This was a fun episode. Very fun episode. So, so, listeners, <laughs> <laughs> listeners, if you have story suggestions, paranormal or true crime, send us a message at hauntedfamilypodcast at gmail dot com, or hit us up on Facebook or Instagram. Or if you have a stupid criminal. Yeah, send it our way. We love to hear from our listeners. Like, literally, you make our day when you message us. We do happy yeah. dances, and then we screenshot it and send it to the other person. And then that person does a happy dance, and it's just, we're dorks. Um, if you are a fan of our podcast, Which and you should be, want you're to listening. start one of your... 
Right. Yeah, obviously. Or, or maybe you listen because you like hate listen or something. And really, you can't stand us, but you listen because you want to laugh about it or something. We're okay with we that, don't too, care. as long as you listen. I know. Like, a download is a download. We don't care why you listen. But let's say that you are a fan and you want to start your own podcast. Uh, we highly suggest Podbean. Um, we Podbean, love Podbean. Let's, you, we do. We so love Podbean. You can uh, fully integrate your website. You can have access to all of these wonderful analytics that will tell you where your listeners are. Um, you can set it what up. What state, yeah. what country. You can, you can look at what device they're listening to you on. Um, you can set it up so that when you upload your podcast to Podbean, it automatically sends it to your YouTube channel, formats it, and puts it on your YouTube channel. Which is awesome. I mean, Podbean does so, so much. Um, our last host site was fine, but it did not have near the bells and whistles that Podbean had. It was a good and starter. Actually, it was a good starter host service. Yeah, I mean, and, and actually we're paying about the same per month that we did with the other one, and we just get so much more. We can, you know, we don't have a limit on how long we can record. Like, unedited, we're already at the almost two-hour mark, and with our last host site, they would cut us off at an hour. So this would, end up, yeah, this would end up being two episodes with our old host site, and we don't really like that, and I don't like listening to multi-part episodes, and I know Holly doesn't either. We just, I mean, we're instant gratification people. Yeah. Um, so if you want to start a podcast, we recommend Podbean, and we recommend that you use our affiliate code, which is Haunted Family PB. If you want a direct link, um, just send me a message and I'll send you the direct link. No problem. We love Podbean. We know that you will love Podbean. And we were singing the praises of Podbean even before I signed us up for the affiliate code. Oh, yeah. Like, we, we tell people, like, even without getting anything in return, we just absolutely love Podbean. So true. So very, very true. Um, speaking of our analytics... Wyoming, where are you? Not listening to us, so they don't know you're calling them out. I know. Wyoming, you're being lame. If you have friends in Wyoming, tell them they need to start listening to us. Not that I'm ordering you all around or anything, but I am. Seriously, I love the state of Wyoming, so I'm sad that Wyoming isn't listening to us. Um, yeah, I found that out right before we went to record. I went over to our host site and pulled up the analytics. And was going through each state and how much they listen to us and how much they love us. And um, I'm sure we mentioned a few episodes ago that we finally have Rhode Island listening to us. we go Rhode Woo! Island! I think, um, I believe that us tickering the state with our um, business cards really paid off. So I guess we'll have to go to Wyoming next. Yeah, that's a little bit farther away. A little bit. And I think they're getting ready for winter up there, so... Probably next spring. Yeah. Because we don't like the cold. We don't. That's why we live in Kentucky. Kentucky is just barely in our top ten of listeners. Listening states. I know. Kentucky, why do you hate us? Cal You're one of your own. California is still number one. So maybe we should move to California. Because clearly we're not getting the love of our home state of Kentucky. I know, but see, every time I think about that, like... California Girls pops into my head. I don't know why. But it does. Should we mention this link that you just sent me? Um, you can if you want. I thought we could talk about it later. but Okay, we'll talk about it later. Okay. Holly just sent me a very interesting link that kind of references a past episode. Um, and we will discuss this the next time we record. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for listening. We love you so much. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.